introduce tonight's speaker, Misha Khan, who was born in Duluth, Minnesota, and graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design um, with a BFA in furniture design in 2011. Uh, his work exists at the inter intersection of design and sculpture, exploring a wide variety of media and scales from mouse to house. Uh, Khan's approach melds an array of processes from casting, carving, welding, and weaving to imaginative and singular modes of production. According to former president of uh, RISD, John Maida, quote, Misha creates work for a par parallel wonderland where traditional perception of material and structure is pushed to the edges of the room to make space for one big party, unquote. His work has been exhibited internationally and is in the uh, permanent collection of numerous museums and public collections, uh, such as the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and the Corning Museum, Museum of Glass. Um, you're also, you've also um, spent today preparing for a, an exhibition um, with the Library Street Collective. Uh, when, when will that open? Uh, next year. Next year, yeah, great. So uh, help me, uh, please help me wel welcome Misha Khan. Thank you very much. For Okay, so obviously timeliness and organization are not personal strong suits. Um, and I'll start with another disclaimer because I feel like going to lectures in college, um, I would be really judgmental about how people organized their own work. And if people went chronologically, I found it particularly irksome because I was like, there must be a better way to organize the things you've made than just the arbitrary flow of time of your life. And then of course, when you go to do it for yourself, it's actually quite tricky to figure out how to, how to order things. So I did kind of chronology light. And so there's sort of different series and there's loose threads that kind of keep maybe connecting and finding themselves. Um, obviously being in school, I only went to undergrad and really wanted to come to Cranbrook and then never got around to it or applied. Not that I would have gotten in. Um, and, but I've, I've known so many people from here and obviously it's such a storied place, but just personally, um, have had some amazing people come to my studio, uh, and Christian who runs my studio is from here and, uh, is a, a big part of the operation. So anyways, this first piece was the, the first thing I made after school. Um, I'd, I'd taken kind of a year off on a Fulbright and had spent the year making shoes and kind of entertaining more of a fashion interest that I had. Um, and I feel like doing something of a purge from my RISD entrenched ideology. And there, um, the design ethos is very much to draw something and then to produce the thing that you drew. And I've always been a bad drawer and it never really like gelled with me. And the other major thing that I feel like was the structure of that education was thinking about cohesiveness and how a form would be entirely cohesive. Um, and I feel like during my year of rest and relaxation in Tel Aviv, I was kind of unraveling that and feeling like people are really complex and we have a lot of different aspects to ourselves and we're not always cohesive and our stories are not cohesive. And I've just always felt that objects should sort of embody that complexity rather than trying to dangle some false hope. Um, so this one is really like a Barbie creation of trash layered together to be a tree. And it's called a pig bench because in Minnesota, uh, that's a very popular, probably here too, just like logs cut down uh, with legs that are branches that happen to work well. Um, and this series kind of continued a little, oh, it is gonna go slow. Um, continues and then kind of becomes a wood series where I was, I was then just layering scraps of wood and, and any kind of material like MDF that's made from wood um, in the same way, which was just like kind of not the nihilism of recreating a tree. Um, 
And then it kind of, th this happens later, but I sort of realized that like a pig bench could be anything and the, the idea of copying a tree became less and less important. So this is in Swaziland, cutting up chunks of cars. Um, and I think I also just have always been trying to make everything go faster. So the layering was too much work. So here's a pile of trash that's gonna get metal dumped over it. So rather than trying to layer up coat after coat, we could just get it in one go. Uh, here's another one of those experiments in bronze, which is not a very good material to experiment with. But we tried it and it was okay. I think there's some good sort of Treasure Island details in here where, where stuff kind of gets lost and then emerges again. This was a really failed version of that. This is a compacted bundle of trash that was given the same treatment of kind of a metal dump over it. Um, and here, probably the laziest iteration was just a big chunk of a car, car wreck that put into it. Um, this was another really early series after school, um, I was talking to someone at lunch about how having hippie parents that liked really earthy things, I had sort of a late in life rebellion um, and wanted to make these things that were kind of emulating strip mall culture. And obviously w wanting to cast plastic yourself is a, a difficult desire because normally it's an expensive injection mold process. Um, and even to make a rubber mold is I find personally quite annoying. So I was sort of thinking about ways to skip this process and I'd just been spending a lot of time making shoes so sewing patterns just felt very obvious and it made sense to me that essentially if you were to blow up the pattern you could rotocast inside of it. So you could take this now inflated form and spin it and just get a cast of the outside of the, the outside of the inside. Um, and it failed so many times before it, I got it to work. Um, and the key was Martha Stewart crafts paint around the stitches. Um, but it became a really easy, they're, they're almost instantaneous because you can, it's just a single stitch and then uh, the resin sets quite quickly. So it was a really good way to just kind of like sketch out ideas and to just be really fast and, and sort of fluid with them. Started really small, here's a bunch of jewelry. Um, and then it, it starts getting sort of bigger and I figured I'd put in a bit of a process shot um, showing the air going in and some bricks to hold the glass in place. This one has two panels because I thought maybe they should have sort of pastoral scenes embedded in them. There was some sconces, because obviously it's already hollow, so it was a, sort of a natural thing to run wiring through. These ones are huge, but it's you would never know in a picture. This was kind of the culmination of that series, was, was getting a show um, at the Museum of Art and Design, and all of the things I showed there were kind of just these like messes of installation. But this was a, a bunch of experiments from that, that little series. I kind of immediately wanted them to be more 3D. Like es essentially what, what is happening is it's just like a 2D surface that was getting puffed up. Um, so this was a slower way of doing it, but these are, are already bigger volumes where I was using really slow resin and air so I could kind of be brushing it in instead. Um, and then some failed experiments to make them, I shouldn't say failed because I think someone bought this, but um, uh, more 3D patterning I thought could be a way to do it. And then there was other, I, I figured I'd throw in a bunch of things that were like really dubious directions taken because I thought that might be kind of th at least therapeutic for you. Um, this one I was like, maybe the answer is just soaking sponges in resin and stabbing bamboo through it. And like that would be a really quick way to build. And then the resin part can just be kind of more simple. This one is just 
uh, inserting, you know, making extra pieces that would then kind of fit together. And more and more the mirrors, I, I don't really like mirrors, but I do like that they're reflecting our face and our face always has hair around it. Um, and so something about like the frames being hairdos, it just makes sense to me. So this one is, is very literal. Anyways, it starts moving in, I, I kind of start moving this series into concrete because it was, that way the, the material took longer to set and would be structural. And the, the early method was just kind of hanging these molds up from any sort of ceiling surface and filling them. Um, and, and the molds were, were sewn so they were a little bit more complicated. There'd be a lot of insert panels so I could, I could fill them quite a bit more. I guess I put in a lot of those. This was a r really dubious planter idea where I was like, oh, maybe instead of hanging them up, which was really annoying, I should just fill tubes and the tubes could get coiled up. And it kind of references how you might build a ceramic vessel, um, except for like without squishing the coils together. Um, and th those were kind of fun, but they were very hard to ship. And then some of them, I, I wanted to start putting the fabric back in it because I think that people you couldn't really tell what material it was being cast in. Um, and it seemed like the, the fabric was a nice part of it. So this one, I left some panes in. This was just a floor. I, the way that the colors would naturally bleed into those I thought was quite nice. Um, it has kind of a natural watercolor effect. So this was sort of a, a taking advantage of that. And after this, I feel like I was constantly trying to find ways to make this already lazy process even lazier. So this was me seeing like, well, instead of having to peel the wrapper off, which was the only mildly labor intensive part, could I just incinerate it? Uh, and that didn't work very well. This was another option where I thought maybe instead of filling the molds, I could just put Halloween blowers in them, like the kind you, you use in your yard to keep it inflated. Um, and when people would come home, they'd turn on the light and the light would just inflate for you. Um, and this is great, except for those cheap electronics do not last forever. This was another thought, like maybe I should just be stuffing these things. Like why am I filling them with such heavy things? Maybe they, they, don't, they can just be filled with batting. Um, and this technique ended up being really useful because it allowed for something that could get shipped to places to get cast. So then that series kind of just took like a meandering turn uh, into being these, these cast bronze versions. Um, and I like that these captured like the sad wrinkly factor because they didn't have to be so infilled. Like with the, the early stuff, it was always so poppy because it had to get fully inflated. Um, and these really have like a much more languid vibe. Um, this is a, a, a similar version where a rubber mold is made from a concrete cast in a vinyl mold. And I feel like this is the stuff that started happening as I, I moved and uh, started working with Friedman Benda. And all of a sudden there was a gallery and people wanting to buy the things. And um, there's just so many concerns that go with that, such as making everything robust enough. And uh, I, But I think what was also really interesting about it was then getting these more layered ways of producing something. So like this is, would be the most roundabout way to get to an aluminum object, but then it, it happens sort of organically. So it's kind of a, a nice curious thing. This is a, a little stool from the same method. This is a really failed idea. Um, these, this was another building idea I had, which was just to use chicken wire and Christmas tree garland and then to coat it all with resin. 
And it does work really well because it's kind of like a 3D fiberglass um, and it's very sparkly and poppy, um, but they, they never really went anywhere. Um, so this was a, a first show that I did with Friedman Benda in, uh, out in San Francisco and had a lot of the, the kind of concrete stuff and some of the earlier resin things. After that show, there was, there was a bunch of those early works that had a lot of experimental zeal, but maybe needed a little like more material mm, realness in it. And so I got set up at a bronze foundry in Cape Town and went with a bunch of ideas. But I, as with the earlier stuff, I really wanted to avoid the sort of laborious part of mold making. Um, and so I like the idea that since tinfoil melts lower than bronze, potentially I could just build everything out of tinfoil and then do the investment casting but skip the whole molding part and the bronze would melt the tinfoil, which works really well in theory, but in reality it just sort of made little clogs. But what did end up working really well was using tinfoil just to make a sheet material and then with the warm wax, uh, in the foil, you could then sort of press it into any shape. So you'd have this kind of malleable sheet, um, but with a, this kind of rigid, crinkly texture. So here we are pouring a, a table on the floor. Uh, and then the tin foil gets peeled off, and you're just left with, with that texture. I like that this series was... The tin foil quality, I think, is kind of like a fun Americana thing. Um, I really like the some little visual aspects of the Raelians, um, which is a, a sort of upstate New York cult that uh, was started and involves the tinfoil hats. Um, and I also like it as like a fixing thing, like when, when you're just like desperate to hold things together and people would just wrap it with tinfoil. So I thought kind of bringing that into a bronze object would be interesting. This was kind of the start of like figuring out how to use that a, a, in maybe a slightly more complex way. So uh, including these river rocks um, and then also these kind of stained glass components that were made out of scraps that I found in the ocean. Um, and metal is obviously great. You know, it's, we use it so much this way in jewelry to, to create settings, but that's not usually the impulse on a larger scale. Um, so this was kind of a, a foray in that direction. During that same first trip to Africa, I, I went and I, I sort of got set up on a little craft tour of Swaziland and met this really fantastic group of women uh, basket weavers. And so we worked on a bunch of experiments that I, I stayed for a few weeks um, and we just made a few chandeliers. This one's made out of uh, this clear plastic tubing. And I let all, all over the country there was these roadside stands that would sell enemas, which is very popular, and they'd be these sort of tin cans with like really long plastic hoses coming out of them um, and live electrical wires to warm the water. And I just like, everything about it was so cool. And <laughs> that was kind of the impetus behind this chandelier and like using all of this like, clear tubing. Um, this was is very, this is like their traditional weave. It's, it's um, lavumisa, it's a coarse grass with a thinner sisal fiber over it. Um, and this is the way that they're, they're used to working. Um, and this form is actually really similar to, to these kind of historical Swazi vessels that have these really strange arms that wrap around and reconnect with other parts of it. So I wanted to do something using that um, and I still kind of felt like it was too, this was too like dead on, like we weren't messing things up enough. Um, and so then we tried this one, which was just not using the sisal and just using everything that was lying around. There was lots of banana leaves, uh, cow bones, just chunks of 
everything. There's a restaurant down the street, so there's always big piles of bones. Uh, this is another sort of traditional woven one. And I'll also just mention the glass, which is also made there, is by a really, a, fa a factory that got set up by Swedish people there, um, and they just, in the 40s, and they just use recycled Coke bottles and run all of their furnaces on old KFC oil. Um, so sometimes I think like the way that we try and retrofit sustainability, you just go to a place that does it like really naturally, and, and I like that part of it a lot. This was the first plan for a larger piece. I, I wanted to do a big cabinet. Um, traditionally there, they make a lot of, they, they used to make enormous vessels to hold grain. That would be these sort of 12 foot baskets. And so I like the idea of finding a way to make a really large piece um, that would kind of allow for that same aspect of, of making, I suppose, where, where people are all working on it together rather than what they mostly make now, which is smaller scale items. So this is the first one next to his little model. Um, going back, I, I, there was a bunch of reasons for this, but I wanted to work on something using less of the raw material. It felt like I was just like using up so much of the stuff that should get made for other things, like normal products. Um, and they'd had a bad drought. So the idea of just kind of using more scraps seemed really natural. Um, and this was kind of the first plan to just use bits and pieces of everything. So to kind of get everyone on the same page, I tried to make these weaving maps that would, would um, create sort of more energetic compositions. Because usually when you're weaving, you're kind of going back and forth. So I knew I wanted it to feel more intuitive, even though I guess that's a bit of a lie here, um, and meandering. These are just some early samples. This is the, f the frame structure. And so then basically by making the frames really inconvenient shapes, it kind of forced the weaving to have to follow these uh, tricky contours, which I think help give it the sort of the texturing. And here's a, a large cabinet version of that. And another one, and one more. And then this series was kind of, at, came after that and I thought it'd be sort of nice to merge all of it. Um, they're really just super, oh well, they're tiny. Um, but they're kind of little wild components, um, but also still using a lot of the traditional weaving. Um, and here's a chandelier with lots of activity going on. This one, then I feel like it was just like everything goes. This one's woven mostly with fiber optics. So we're using side glow fiber optics and like thin fiber optic wire, but also mixing in beads and fishing line and grass and chunks of fabric. Um, and then these stained glass globes that we made in my studio that, and this was the craziest thing I have ever tried to accomplish, but soldering all the LED strips in around each scrap of glass, um, which I don't know if anyone would notice. This was a model for a, a big 16-foot scrappy thing. Here's a bunch of Jello salad. Um, I have always loved Jello, and I feel like this was happening at the same time during that trip was just feeling like everything in this, like everything that was kind of being developed in design was like, just looks like jello to me. Um, and obviously in comparison to sort of older designs that's drawn by hand um, and, and how it thing, the computer wants to make things mushy. And so I wanted to make something of, to, to do with, with like this issue of like the jellification. And so I, I wanted to, I borrowed a lot of images and really harvested the internet and every library I could find with Jello images. Um, and then also was morphing some of them myself. And, 
and drawing some into the, these sort of scapes, and then obviously using some computer stuff to make some fantasy jello that didn't exist already. And this, I can't tell you why, was the final composition, um, but I wanted to have this big tapestry made of all the jellos in a kind of big rock candy mountain, sort of like utopia that might also feel a little bit problematic. Um, this is in South Africa, in Johannesburg, but the, the yarn and the mohair is all spun and dyed in Swaziland. So that's where I kind of met Mags, who's d who does the weaving on these. Um, and there's the finished piece. This was in the first, uh, my first show at the gallery. This is thinking about the next tapestry. I felt like the, the yarn going into it was such a cool part and not um, they're, as sort of weavers, they're always just representing someone else's work, and I'm really in, obviously mostly interested in how things are made, or that's a big part of it. Um, so it seemed natural to kind of use string to make the images that would get rendered in string, um, and somehow less arbitrary. But then the thing I was depicting started feeling really arbitrary. So um, this is the tapestry that's getting made for the next show that's halfway done as we speak. Um, was was me kind of weaving in virtual reality and like using this computer tool that makes everything jello-y to make a weaving pattern. Um, and then this is this is that piece getting translated um, into back into fabric. This was a drawing for a piece from that first show, and I, I think moving to Friedman Bend, I had like a I felt a lot of pressure to kind of do something technical or like produce things that would be like really thorough. Um, and so this was kind of like directions taken. Um, these are just parts for this chandelier that I thought just had to have like a million pieces of glass. We had to put our own filaments in it. Um, and, and there it is, it was just like a, a wild undertaking. Another element I, I really liked from this show was th uh, w the floor was made by back painting vinyl, um, which is my cheap version of Eglomise, um, and putting them on, on particle boards. And I think it was one of the most successful parts of this show because at the end of it, we sold them all individually. And there was, I th think, just short of 200 tiles, and it was like 100 bucks for a tile. And so somehow I still, every time I'm out in New York, run into people who tell me that they have a tile. And so it was a really, I think it was a really nice way that, that early on, like a lot of people got sort of invested and, and enthusiastic. Somewhere after that show was Trump got elected and the, my response was, um, these like melting glass gems that sort of felt like a cancerous ersatz slime that was gonna cover everything. And I feel like right before the election, I'd had a really um, wild drug-fueled time at, at his hotel in Atlantic City. And it was like so depraved, but everything was like coated with these sort of like glitzy touches that were really cheap. And it was just felt like, anyways. Um, so th these are some pieces with that, and so the technique is really f fun and loose. I feel like glass is really fussy, um, but this way there's no blowing and there's, there's really no glass work. It's just dropping glass straight onto a marver, um, and then we take the glass while it's hot and drape it over the metal thing. Um, and so it's just like really free and, and, and loose. Um, and then the earlier ones are all put on these kind of banged up, garage weld style uh, ca caseworks. And here was a kind of strange bench version of this. And they get a little bit nicer and a little bit closer to their source material. Uh, here's a coffee table version. This one has a, the, the other one that I was using a tin foil as the backing. Um, tin foil melts really close to glass temperature. 
So the glass would, pit, would melt the foil onto the back and make kind of a cheap mirror surface. Um, and this one is using uh, this copper strand that's, that you stuff in holes to keep mice from chewing through it. Um, it has kind of a, it, it made like a nice hair texture. Um, this is a, I feel like that was kind of a gateway into using a lot more glass and like thinking about how to incorporate glass. Um, and so I just threw in this one chandelier that's very silly. Um, th there was a gel series that also came out of that, uh, which was, I just found this material that they use in hospital beds uh, that's a viscous solid that's very supportive and ergonomic, but also feels sort of like an implant. Um, and it seemed really nice to sort of implant those into objects to make them comfortable, sort of sickly, but also ergonomic and kind of sexy. This is the start of a cabinet that was kind of like, well, why does it all need to be one material? Why not like start setting any material in? And I think once you s take off restraints, then it just turns into chaos, but um, it's kind of fun chaos. So this is that, that piece finished. And I think that one had a lot of kind of gem setting elements to it. It started feeling more and more like I was like applying these gems. Um, and then th this thought came up, which was to sort of go back to the tin foil thing to, to use that because it's so easy to kind of set things with um, and to just work off of these, these really big boulders. So basically we could take the tin foil and wax and press it onto a boulder to, to make a big gypsy setting, um, which is a great way to make a table. So this was, this was that method. And here's a seat version. There's a candelabra. Uh, this was last week's experiment, so I just had the first one back, but it was doing the same thing with glass. So creating blown glass shapes this time, but kind of in the same way as the blobs, pressing them against the form so we could just get these really natural fit. And now in a other departure. Um, I think with all with with the the tin foil stuff and the bronze things, it was always so planar. Like everything's kind of always a sheet, and so it was always just sort of morphing it to be, uh, like feel like it was occupying a volume. So it, I wanted to start making things that were just more fully like, fully formed, fully enlarged, um, and so. Well at the foundry, they were telling me that I could scan little clay models and they would see and see it into the sand and do castings directly that way, which was really appealing, but it was kind of impossible to convince people to pay for the production of an object when you're just showing them a tiny clay model. So we still had to, we ended up carving these things uh, in 3D and, and sort of fully fabricating them in insulation foam. Uh, here's a drawing for a larger console and an initial version in, a, in tiny clay. Um, and there's that piece. There's the, those are the chair parts with, they just get a drywall coated. I shouldn't say just because this takes forever, but they get coated with drywall and sanded down. Um, and there's the finished version. This is the, obviously the earlier one. Um, and now in studio, I'm working on, on, these pieces are all molded, so each one is an addition of eight. Um, and I've always liked to be able to do things in a way that we could just make one of each thing. I don't really feel a desire for there to be multiples of anything. and. So I want, we built a, a big sand bin and our own furnace so we could start casting things ourselves. 
Um, and this is like an early attempt at, at just doing a lost foam method where we're just burying foam pieces and the hot aluminum incinerates the foam under the sand pile. And they're really crude. So it, in a way, it feels like stepping backwards. But um, it's one method to be able to just produce something that, that doesn't have a replica to it. The other method I'm exploring right now uh, is sculpting everything in, in VR, which is just the, actually the nicest way to work. Um, here's another one of the lost foam with some glass. Uh, and this is the first one from, this is the first piece from this VR sculpted version uh, where it goes directly into a print and then dip, dipped in wax and then that's cast. So that feels like the most magical way of skipping a mold. Um, Uh, this metal series then kind of morphed and turned into um, a series of, of soft things that have had the same visual language of these kind of fluid clay shapes. Uh, this is the first couch from that exploration. This is a model for uh, a chair. A, a chair in the same way, so just kind of making little models in clay uh, and then seeing how closely we could emulate them in fabric. We are doing all of this in studio, so it's, a it's just all welded with gluing cushions on it, so it's very, uh, the look when it leaves our studio is sort of like foam chainsaw art. And then fortunately the upholsterer is able to smooth that over. So here's the finished version of that one. In wanting to make this a little bit sleeker, um, we've moved into to doing them all 3D uh, in the computer and then making molds of these. So now we're, we're doing like a slip cast of foam and the cushion covers will be 3D knit so we don't have to have seams anymore, which just allows for like s some trickier things to happen like con concave surfaces. Here's an example of the look pre-fabric. Uh, and this is a couch that we're working on that, that will get the 3D net version. Um, so these mirrors are sort of from the same, I wonder, oh, here we go. It's kind of the same attitude of, of putting these like fluid shapes together that that feel. I I th feel like they still ha retain like the miniature quality, um, and it was also a really good way. I feel like I ha have a lot of impulse to just experiment with things in studio, and there's so much waste and so many like oddities that could be kind of nice, but they're it doesn't like become a larger object. Uh, and so these collage mirrors were sort of a good way to cannibalize those things and then build these little lucid narratives around them. This one has a touch of some ceramic on the side. These are, are tiles and then they're grouted together. And then this one has like a little bit of everything, like some of the lost foam casting, some of the resin. This is a model for a shelf. And then here was all the parts. This is a, 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 another lost foam version. Um, and there's that finished piece. This was another road not taken, which was thinking about building more sculptural things in concrete and then covering them all in ceramic tiles. And I like the idea that we would just like, as humans kind of make things and then just come up with coatings for them. Um, and it was at a lot of baths in Eastern Europe where they had to do really insane tile jobs to like cover up how weird and, and mangled the architecture had gotten over the years. Um, and I liked that challenge. And so I kind of set out to like 
give it to myself. Um, this was like a first experiment. And then this was a nicer piece from, from that avenue um, where everything gets to be made in a tile. And it allowed us to do things in ceramics at a scale that we could manage, not having a huge kiln, um, and also to put a lot of structural stuff inside of it so it could be uh, maybe useful. Um, and I also like that if a part broke, you could, you know, we could just replace it instead of having to fix the whole thing. Here's some install shots from my second show at Freeman Benda. The doors, I wanted to just make these big mangled trash gates that you would have to pull open uh, so you'd feel like you were walking into, into like a trash riddled hell. Uh, in the front half was a lot of the sort of scrappy pieces. On the left, there's a, a sort of a pig version of a, of a lamp that has a lost foam, cast aluminum and bronze that's connecting all of these trash pieces. Uh, and all, the, all this stuff is standing on piles of dirt. Um, on the other side, they were standing in little pools of water. I don't know what that was about. This is a model for a little ring. Um, I, I got the opportunity to work with uh, this jeweler, Giancarlo Montebello, who's now uh, well in his 80s and just like a really incredible jeweler. Um, and I had this idea, uh, the idea I wanted to pursue was doing something with, with precious stones, but they're, where they're not set. I, it felt like to me and sort of my understanding of, of like a ring, especially a ring for a relationship thinking about making something that would be static felt not very true to form. So uh, I wanted it to be like a little pinball machine and like also something that you could kind of just fidget with. So if you were sitting somewhere, instead of playing with your phone, you'd have this little pinball machine. So we set out to produce this. This was a, a rough prototype in silver just to get the scale right. Um, and this is the final one, which is in anodized titanium, and then there's little rubies that roll around the titanium track. Uh, and the, the bottom is gold. It's crazy. Here's some install shots from my show in Dallas at the Dallas Museum, or a, sh a show that I'm in at the Dallas Museum, rather. Um, the this was sort of my first larger museum installation. It was an interesting project because they wanted to do something uh, that was really inclusive. There wasn't going to be any text to go along with it. Um, people were going to be able to touch everything. And it was also just meant to be for an audience that might not normally get to enjoy or experience things at a museum. Um, so I wanted to make sculptures, but in some way that was more friendly. Um, and also kind of riff off of how much I like seeing objects in museum storage, which is not something that most people get to see. So when they're covered, when they're draped in fabric, um, and you can kind of just tell what they are from the silhouette. So the room is these sculptures that inflate and deflate as you're walking through it, and there's these painted silk bags on the outside, but they're, they're sort of translucent, so you can kind of see the shapes underneath. This is um, a project that was probably kind of related to that uh, for earlier, was wanting to make these silk covers for weather balloons. I feel like I obviously like inflatables and balloons, but wanted there's, there's always kind of a commercial aspect to their finish, like sort of the crispness of the colors. Uh, so coming up with a way that we could do it that they would feel more like soft watercolors. So this was just balloons for a little event. There's one in the studio. This is another project. Um, I got asked to design a sort of scuba diving park in the Maldives. 
um, which is a really challenging place to make things. The islands are, are miniature. They're, I feel like they're basically the size of this auditorium, um, just like thousands of miles from everywhere. So we had to figure out a way to make everything on the island, um, which it was very challenging. We had, everything had to get shipped in from India. Um, and so we used the beach that was there basically to build the molds for the, these large concrete structures. And this was kind of a good combination of everything. We used a lot of the fabric molding technique of, of creating, stringing up big bags and sort of like containing them somehow. Um, and then we had a big uh, cr labor crew to help us mosaic everything. So the surface was, was a little less precious. This is the craziest thing to put at the end, but this was another commission, which is probably just proof that people will ask you to do anything. But someone in Atlanta asked if I would design something for her cats, um, because she didn't like that they would climb on her while she was sleeping. Um, so I made this sort of like loosely Japonais uh, wallpaper cat scratch climbing situation. And I think in one of the night, I, uh, my favorite part of the project is that when it came up, she was like, okay, well, obviously first I will fly you down to meet the cats so you get a sense of their personality. Um, <laughs> and I had a flight and was in Atlanta for like four hours with like a black car to take me to meet the cats <laughs> and laid out the material samples for them. And the cats are actually <laughs> very specific. They didn't like to walk on carpeting. They did like cardboard. Um, yeah, it was just, they, they didn't like hard lines. Like if she had a rug with a, with a hard outline, they would walk around it. Um, and actually researching cat psychology for, for the architecture, they, they won't go through an opening if their head's not covered. Like if you have a cat door and there's not something to sort of guard their head when it goes through, um, they, they won't like to walk out of it. So I liked the shift in client. There's just, I don't know, I threw in another install shot. Is it, re is it, can we, do people have questions? Or I, I actually should have said this, but I would be like, I just wanted people to shout questions the whole time. Oh my gosh, do you, that's, do you have internet here? <laughs> I'll show, I'll, I can show you a little home tour. Um, I, I live with my boyfriend and he, when we met, had an extremely minimal apartment. It was all uh, black leather furniture with chrome surfaces and I, um, in, but he's severely colorblind. Like I would say he's so colorblind that it, I, I'm, I'm just always shocked that it's even possible to navigate the world. And so our house is kind of, my impulse was sort of to like not go so crazy with the volumes of things, but to like do really intense color treatment because I think he's kind of, that way it's more unobtrusive. Like, I feel like we compromised. Um, I was really tempted to paint all of the walls of Paisley of all the colors he can't see the difference between. So that other, <laughs> I thought that, that could work.
does anyone else have questions while this apartment tour is loading? <laughs> Um, I have since school, I think, become a much stronger drawer. Like, I feel like I can draw what I'm imagining quite quickly now, whereas it used to be, like, a, a big chore to try and, like, extract that. Um, so in that way, it's, that part's easier. But I, I actually feel like I have, like, a really fluid version of drawing. Like, I'll make a little sketch and then start working on it and then just, like, change it really drastically while working on it and then make another little sketch. Um, so I think it was just becoming less like directional with like, like drawing is a useful tool at like any point in the process. And it's not, like the goal is not to ever achieve the drawing. Like the drawing is just to like be part of it. Um, and I also think it made it drawing more like more thera therapy for me. Like I could sort of sketch something and not be judgmental about like, j just like realizing that the thing I'm drawing I'm not gonna make. So it can be anything. Um, and then it it was it's like easier to sketch a lot more freely when you're not like constantly judging the drawing for being like a shitty object. And yeah, yes. Um, like frequently, the sort of resin thing, the resin inflatable stuff, which I saw as these kind of like dilapidated strip malls things, have ended up obviously in these houses that are like all white with a few pop art objects that I find like very uncomfortable spaces. So. Sometimes other people's inclinations with things is really informative. I would really like to have a department store with everything where I get to do it all. But I think more than like an Eliel approach, I fantasize about like a cruise ship or a prison or a casino or like something that's a little bit more, uh, not a place of like, Im not an important place, like a, just a place you go. <laughs> I'm glad there's a one vote for cruise ship. Uh, this is my living room. This is our little eating area. Um, I didn't realize that the Pesci table we were getting was a rubber one. And then when it arrived, I, I called the gal I called Mark at the gallery and was like, Mark, the table's rubber. Like we were thinking it was gonna be our dining table. Um, and he just said, Well, you know the series is about the collapse of the European Union. <laughs> There's our the, here you can see the two sides of the closet. It's rather starkly here. Um, and this is, oh, I sort of have to zoom out so you can get it all at once. Is there a way? Well, the kitchen's crazy. This was the night before the photo shoot, and I was really, I was panicking that our apartment was too minimal. Uh, <laughs> so I made Nick come to my studio at really late, and we painted all of this. Um, and it was also one of the, this was another moment where like I would probably have chosen like a color palette, but then like the color palette was obviously just like all the colors, so. Yeah, that's the, that's our house. 
Um, I w I'll also add that I think like this, getting to live with some re I, I should, uh, real pieces, like pieces by pe people who I really admire has been really useful as sort of just spending a lot of time with them and noticing how thoughtfully all the elements were put together and how well they were made. Um, and then like how much I enjoyed that, like the, the closing of the cabinet or like being able to pull on the tufts uh, to open it up and that, that they're always fine was really good for me. I just feel like I was like, oh, this is, I want my objects to, to be like this. Yeah, um, weirdly, th I'm not a very, this one I'll just mention, I'm not a very sentimental person, um, and this mirror my dad had helped me make, and then you know a few weeks later I'd sold it, uh, and the client came back a little over a year later and said that they wanted a red one instead, and I was just so happy to get it back, um, because I, it was just like, was one that I weirdly knew I, I wanted to have. so. Um, I don't usually care about keeping my own things, but then there's there's usually reasons like that where something I, I want to hang on to. Um, and, but I don't know, I mean, I feel like I spend so much time, I, I've definitely heard people say like artists shouldn't live with their own work and that that's like a thing that that everyone says. And I actually think it is kind of helpful to to live with it and it starts, feeling normal to you and so you want to take it for it like basically getting bored of your own work is like the most helpful thing for motivation yeah